Michel Tricot, co-founder of, Air, of Airbyte.io. Welcome to the Data Exchange Podcast. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for having me. Long time coming. So uh, we'll talk a lot about Airbyte, but first, and actually, actually, let's start here. So origin story of Airbyte, right? So obviously, uh, data integration, not a new topic. Uh, but in the last few years, there's been kind of a, new uh, wave of solutions, both open source and proprietary, targeting the cloud, emphasizing EL instead of ETL, right? Mm -hmm. so, so in that in, in that whole context, so give me the origin story for Airbyte. Yeah, so I would say the, the first thing is both my co-founder and I have had our fair share of building data integration. I've been in that space for the past 15 years and I've been leading teams and building, maintaining and scaling thousands of different data integration and data connectors. So got a lot of battle scar from it. And I I'm, I'm went from one uh, like financial company to like internet scale company to uh, uh, IoT company and what you realize like going although it's like very different industries you realize that so every single company every single data team is solving the same problem building the same connectors and that was basically one of the uh, of the trigger for for starting a bite now we have a lot more that um, convinced us that that was the the right approach the first one is when you look at all the data products that exist, whether they are open, like especially on the, the the commercial paid one, you have a problem around like the how you can customize, and the problem is like data is so tied to your business and to your uh, internal needs that it's very hard to have like one solution that solves everything. And what we're seeing right now is like industry is moving toward more uh, how would you call that uh, uh, specialized building blocks. And they are composing them to get the best for and the one that works for the organization. And so Airbyte in that case is about like how you can customize how you build data connectors. So if you have a missing one, you can create one. If you have one that doesn't work the way you want, you can edit it and you can change it and adapt it to your need. And the two other ones are more around the, like how you manage data. For, and uh, if you want to connect internal sources or like sensitive sources, a lot of the existing solution are actually require you to send data to them and they feed it back into oh, your see. data warehouse. So that was a, a thing. And after that, it's like everything around pricing, like data, you want to just dump as much data you, you can into warehouses and data lakes. So at that point, you want to make sure that your pricing makes sense with the volume you're, you're feeding. Well, uh, let's get back into the modern data integration solution. But uh, as you reflect on on your days when you were using data integration solutions. Yeah. So I guess I'm gonna name some names here of companies, but I can't get around it. You know, so the, we're talking about the previous generation is Informatica, Talent, mm -hmm. this kind of thing. So um, at what point did, did, uh, did you, and did, I guess this new wave of startups realize there was that this was still largely unsolved problem. Yeah. Um, I think like all these solution and that always goes back to how we think about building data stacks is like all these solution are trying to be full comprehensive solution end to end they, and they try to own 100% of your data value chain. And that works in general. You, you, you start getting this uh, solution internally that works for 60% of your use cases. And the day you need to do something that is a little bit outside of how the solution was thought about, then either you do like huge hack around this solution. You mean, uh, or you you start mean, uh, you mean the, uh, the, the solution may not connect to a source that you're interested in? So if we're just thinking about integration, yes, it could be like a source is missing, a destination is missing, or yeah, you have like missing data inside, but it can sometimes be, oh, I 
like they, they often try to do transformation also all these solutions and it's like oh i don't want to do transformation this world this is very inefficient way of doing transformation so what happened is people branch out of this solution and they start building on the side to like go uh like oh i see so they have like they're in in essence they end up maintaining multiple to, solutions exactly and this is because like this solution of thought through to be like end-to-end -end. and they want to own everything like loading transformation extraction um like sometimes they even try to do bi and so you have like massive monoliths and that doesn't work with today's uh way of thinking about data so before you folks uh, started airbyte did you actually go around and talk to other data engineers yes and, uh, get a sense of uh, what yeah. should be so what 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 would be the uh minimum viable product for you guys to build at that exactly point. yeah exactly and so what we did is we just we we talked to over 50 different companies of that were actually using and paying for these products and what we're asking them is like how are these products great and how are they not and what you discover is that and that, you know you sometimes you just expect a small person i want that list i want that list of great and not great tell me <laughs> so <laughs> Great is generally you get up and running very, pretty quickly. And not great is that the day you pass the honeymoon period with this tool, you realize, oh, and what about this? And what about that? And what about this? And what about that? And then boom, you have a parallel system. And what was interesting is that 100%, like all of them, they were all doing that. So it was not just something that a few companies were doing, it's just all of them, they were all building side uh, data pipelines on the side that were not leveraging these tools. And that's what, uh, and then we just try to figure out like, what are the, like, why, what is missing? And like the, the one I told you before, where these four dimensions, which is missing connectors, lack of customizability on connectors, pricing and data control. And what, and that's basically the, the these four dimensions that we are looking at when building Airbyte and make sure that we really nail not just the whole data uh, value chain, but just we focus on like the data integration piece and the data movement uh, on top of it. So how come, uh, how come um, uh, this generation of data integration solutions uh, stepped away from transformation? Yeah, because when like transformation is basically a synonym for business logic, right. it means that transformation is something that is specific to your organization. It is not something that you can share across uh, across teams and across uh, companies. But extracting data, you can. If you just look at the extraction, loading data, you can. So at that point, and also storage is cheaper. Uh, so at that point, when you look at the data stack, what you think is, okay, let's leave transformation for later. First, let's make sure that I have access to my data and all my data set is not fragmented anymore. And that's why like looking at EL is really about making data accessible to your organization. And then once the data is accessible, you let people go, go, go free with this data and extract the insight and the, the the value that they need from that data so the so you're saying so so i get the connectors the importance of having a good coverage of connectors um and maybe you can go with another solution that covers 60 to 70 percent but then you're left with 30 percent, which is still a lot of connectors that you have to write yourself what's uh, uh talk to us a little bit more about control um why is that important Control, um, I think we've seen over the past five, six years, like, you know, with CC, like all the data regulation. Uh, no, no, but up, why like uh, uh, has that traditionally been the province of the data integration solution? Say it again? Has that been, has this aspect always, has this aspect been kind of a required of a data integration solution in the past? Uh, I mean, I think that has been there. It's just like organization, it, it has been there to some extent, but not 
to the point where it is today. I think today, with all the 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 abuse of that has been that have been happening on data, regulation are a lot stronger, and companies are also very uh, protective of their data, which is. Yes, maybe you think they're okay having their data on like AWS, GCP, and, and Azure, and not all of that data is actually over there. But when you're starting to think about data integration itself, do you really want to plug your internal databases, your internal Kafka into another cloud so that it goes back to you? Like you, you can see like that doesn't generally make sense. So to, you to want that. you want in essence, you want the EL solution to have this capability. Yeah. Otherwise, you'd have to build it yourself. Exactly. And with open source, because. With or open I guess, source, I guess, Michelle, what about uh, uh, do people piece together? Okay, the, my data integration solution doesn't have this. I'll get some kind of data governance solution to to hack together with my EL. Yeah, but. But it's not the best. I, uh, no, no, and I, I think what yeah. matters here is more like the physical pipes that you're creating more than what you're building on top of it, which is, huh. do you want your data to transit through someone else's cloud? And for some data, you don't care. Yeah. For all your internal data, in general, you do care. You don't want people to have access to all the tables you have in your product Oracle database. You want to keep that in-house. You want this replication to happen in-house. And that is... And when you're thinking about E and L, you need to take this kind of use cases into account, which is, it's not about building something that connects to a database and writes somewhere. It's also, where does that run? Uh, and something that can run on the cloud, that's something that can run on your infrastructure. And that, that is what we're doing with, uh, with Airbyte. So EL is infrastructure. Um, so what infrastructure people uh, want is something that works. So why, do, why does it matter that it's open source? It matters that it is open source because as you were saying before, uh, you might have 100 connectors that are supported out of the box in most platform. But what happens if you have like five, six, seven, 100 other services that are not supported? So at that point, you can decide to build them. I mean, you won't have a choice. You will, someone will have to build them. And what has been happening so far is like people just hire engineers to build these data connectors and maintain them internally. By making it open source and by creating like a, a protocol for exchanging data between point A and point B, and because they are general purpose connectors, then suddenly it makes sense to build it and then give it as an open source project and then share the maintenance, the load of the maintenance with the community. And that is why like open source is important. It's, it gives you the ability to extend the platform and it also gives you the ability to customize the platform. Like if you're pulling data from Salesforce and it's missing this particular stream of data, why wait for your ticket to go through a pri like a product manager then be prioritized and then the, the engineering right, like builds it and then it goes back, pass, goes to QA and then it's released. No, you can actually just take it, add it and boom, you're done. Now there's another open source project that chose to build on top of Singer. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I'll name them too. <laughs> yeah, Meltano. But anyway, yeah. uh, uh, I guess there the, the difference is it seems like every connector is like its own GitHub repo, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there's no there's no there's no. Uh, uh, centrality somehow. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, to be clear, yeah. our connectors don't have to live in the Airbyte project. We have, we work with another company who actually has Airbyte connectors on their own repo. It doesn't really matter. Like the reason why it's on today is because we also want to make sure that when you start using Airbyte, you have access to a large catalog of out of the box connector. But then if you want to build your own or if there is a good distribution of another connector on a different repo, you can import it into a byte. Is there some I, I notion? Like the main difference between is there some notion that you guys say uh, okay, so there's uh, 10 connectors between this source and this source. 
do you bless one of them or what, what's how do i if i if i'm an air by user how do i know which one to use yeah if, yeah, if there's I mean, multiple options yeah um so the, the one that are now repo they go through uh, a lot of qa in general they are backed <laughs> by sandbox accounts uh and we periodically test these connectors to make sure that we know when they break uh if it's on a separate repo then we don't really we don't really have control on this so you can use them but we, we they don't have the same uh, level of qa yeah but we want to make sure that we People are aware also, exactly and we track also this so to make sure that once they are mature enough if people want to also bring them to the nearby communities they can and we can also add them to our catalog uh, and make sure that they have they are labeled as like beta community contributed or, or like uh, pre, um, um, yeah like the the, the nearby uh, stamp so you folks made a conscious decision not to build on top of the singer protocol yes right? yeah and so uh, explain yourself yeah <laughs> um, the singer community is extremely fragmented, meaning that everybody has their own implementation of what, how you move data with singer. So what you end up is a very, it's a patchwork of different features. So like, like one connector is going to implement one feature some specific way, another in a, a different way, and there is no real. Um, company supporting Singer today. Yeah, it the was, driving force be, behind it was acquired somehow, right? Yeah, exactly. They got acquired and I think they dropped the ball uh, yeah. on it. And at that point, what we want is to make sure that there is a strong entity that really drives good practices that drive the evolution of the protocol. Which is uh, which, which is huge, actually. I mean, for, yeah. for a developer. Yeah, right? exactly. It's, it's yeah. important because, you know, the promise between b behind data integration is you just want to write sources and you want to write destinations. And then what you want is to make sure that they are pairwise compatible. But if some 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 people just add an extra feature to a source because they know that destination is going to support it, then you end up with uh, like tight coupling between sources and destination. And that breaks the whole story behind like separating extract and load and getting general purpose connectors. So what uh, so what are the key components of Airbyte today? So you've got you've got this set of connectors. Do you what else what else comes with Airbyte? Is there like a dashboard? Is there orchestration? Is you know? Yeah. So we have scheduler. three. Yeah, we have two and two and a half three uh, component to Airbyte. So the first one is. Um, like all the connectors and the protocol that powers this connector, which is how do you build, how do you package, and how do you exchange data between sources and destinations, and all the tooling that goes around it. So, and who, uh, in your experience, who has been able to write connectors? Do they have to be really sophisticated data engineers? Can they be like data scientists? It, yeah, it used to be the case because we did not have the proper tooling, but last May. Or last April, we uh, we released what we call the CDK, and basically it's uh, like libraries and tooling to make it very very simple to write new connectors. So there is always a, a, a learning period at the beginning, but I think like once you write written one, the second one is going to take you like maybe an hour or two to to write, uh, and what we make sure is that it gets automatically packaged and you can run into a byte. So it's very easy to test, very easy to deploy and very easy to, to publish. Uh, so that's the first piece. Like the connector and the protocol are the, the first part. Then we have everything around like the orchestration and the scheduling, which is now that you have these uh, different sources and destinations, how do you make them work together? How do you, when do you run data pipelines? Do you, can, you, that, do you, do you folks have a dashboard? With and yes, yeah, and we data, do have data engineers also like dashboards where they're looking at all the progress of the. Yeah, exactly. So we have dashboards and we have APIs to control, uh, like how we orchestrate all these data pipelines. Um, so once you've installed Core, you have different ways. Either you run it on a single node or you can deploy it on Kubernetes. So what and is the end, uh, 
What is the most complex air by deployment that you're aware of in terms of number of things uh, flowing, number of connectors? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, so we do have some telemetry that we that we read. I don't think we have this type of data, but I can tell you that over the months of uh, September, we've replicated over a hundred billion uh, records wow. across our community. Um, and I don't know how much that it is in terms of volume, but uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty big volume. Uh, I mean, in general, it depends on the type of companies, but you can have like, sometimes they have like three pipelines, sometimes they have 100 pipelines. It really depends on also how they are using Airbyte. Sometimes they just, people just create one connection and then they shut down the connection. Sometimes they just leave the connection alive. So like we, we discover a lot of use cases like that. So you've got workflow management and orchestration and a scheduler then. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that it? Yeah. So the connectors, the workflow management and orchestration. And the UI. And, and the, the UI slash API. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so the and, so where so where does kind of the control of uh, access control, this kind of thing uh, live in Airbyte? Yeah. So access control is it is something that we we offer as part of, of uh, Airbyte Cloud. Uh, it is not something that is Fully embedded into um, into the, the open source project. Not, not everything has to be in the open source. Man. Exactly, and the thing is, there are a lot of guides. Like some people have written guides on how to actually put a login and uh, like security, like like access control on top of Airbyte with open source. Either use like we do that. We use IAP on GCP to do uh, to do that for our own internal instance. So there are a lot of additional. Uh, Building blood that you can add on top of Airbyte to give you these uh, these uh, these features. So, what's in this? Uh, let's say six to twelve month roadmap. Um, so we. So the first one is we're going to be releasing Airbyte Cloud uh, next week. So we'll be focusing a lot on um, like maximizing production usage and getting more and more people to to use Airbyte. Um, We'll have a, a large push also on how we do uh, schema evolution. That is something that is extremely important. Uh, and also- so how, how, are you, that, how are you gonna do that schema? <laughs> that I, so I, I think for, for schema evolution, it, it is like, this is very, very hard. Yeah. And it is one of these cases where we, Especially because we're open source, it's very hard to be super, super opinionated about how we want to do it. I thought you so, were going to say we're using machine learning <laughs> and AI. No, <laughs> no, we are not going to do that. But what we're going to do is we will have a, a concept of policies, like not policies, but um, like default behavior. And you can choose to opt in into this default behavior. Like, for example, it could be what happens if there is a new field? And we can offer you options and you can configure that on a per connection basis saying like, oh, if there is a new, a new film, I just want you to create a new column. Or I, what I want you to do is I want you to stop and to ask me if that should go into an existing field. And having this type of granularity of control on how you want to handle schema migration. Same thing for types. Like ideally you have policies that can automate it, but if you really need to keep that under control because maybe you know that it's not possible to automate and you need to have a, a, a human to make the decision, then we will hand off the decision to the to a human. But so, so you're going to have to build a tool that kind of probes the schema at source and sync, right? Yeah, and so and we do already. Yeah, yeah. We, we already do that. We are okay. very schema driven, meaning yeah. that there is no source for whom we don't know the schema and we don't store the schema uh, across time, like over time. So. If something is mismatched, if there is a mismatch between uh, be between two runs, that's when we're going to apply all these strategies uh, for schema evolution. And so, okay, so schema evolution. What else? What else is on the roadmap? 
Yeah. So one thing we want to do is for 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 cloud is to also offer the ability to separate the control plan and the data plan. And that goes back to what we we're talking about before, which is the control over your data. Right now for cloud, what we've done is we are basically running Airbyte in our cloud. So you still have to ship your data to a third party uh, cloud, which is ours. And what we want is to have the ability to decide where the data plan is. And as long as you give us access to a, uh, um, a place in your infrastructure, like whether it's a Kubernetes cluster or like just an AWS account, we can start uh, running all the replication over there. We still want to keep the control plan uh, under control because we're still iterating on the on the, the product and we want to make sure we don't have to deal with versioning and uh, and uh, like and like the application evolution on prem. So that's how we're thinking about it. Um, we so in, some, in some sense, actually, uh, as I'm thinking about this, uh, so there's the notion. So there's this uh, big area in data engineering around pipelines. But in some sense, you folks are at the very start of that, right? So where, yes. uh, where you basically are just taking data from a uh, source system to a uh, target, and then mm -hmm. the data engineer can build some fancy pipeline along the way after that. Exactly, right? yeah. exactly. Um, and that's why we also integrate with uh, tools like Airflow uh, is to make sure that when people are building this backbone of their data pipeline, they can interact with uh, with Airbyte, and Airbyte is just focusing on getting the data where it needs to be, so that then you can apply all your transformation, quality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, prefect and Dagster. Yeah, nice, right? exactly. By the way, so schema evolution. So this is now, um, what is this called? The, the, what do the people call it? Oh, change data capture, something yes. like that, right? So that's the modern modern term. Yeah. Um, um, yes, I mean, I think it's more like change the data capture is a, like schema evolution is really about the metadata of the data, which is what does, what do my data look like? Change data capture is more about how is my data changing over time? Um, so we also, there, that is something that we need to, uh, to focus uh, a lot more on. I think we have a, already a pretty decent base of uh, support for CDC for main databases, but we want to double down into it to make it support higher scale uh, and um, and extremely reliable. So, so one one big news from the last week from on your guys' side is uh, this license change. Yes, and I don't want to necessarily bore our listeners with the intricacies <laughs> of, of of different licenses. But at a high level, uh, what exactly did you guys do by changing to a different license? Yeah, so we only changed a subset of Airbyte to a new license. The like everything related to connectors, to protocol, CDK, every, that remains MIT. The, the 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 main reason is we only want to. Um, to get one thing out of it, which is we so we want to make sure people can continue to use Airbyte the way they are today. It's just we don't want someone to just start monetizing Airbyte beside, beside us. And the reason is we have a plan on how we want to address the long tail of integration. And the way we want to do it is by actually creating an incentive for contributors to maintain and have an SLA on, connect, on the connector that they are building. And for that, we want to make sure that, yes, we can share this, we, we can get this revenue and we can share it with these uh, contributors. So that was the main reason for the, for the license change. It's like preparing for this uh, new contribution model where we can do some ref share with the, with the community. I see, I see. And uh, what has been the reception? Uh, pretty, pretty good, yeah. It's uh, you know, when you do a license change, it's uh, it's always um, you have to be careful. You, you have to be careful, but like the Elastic Search license, I mean, the Elastic license is actually really good because it is extremely, extremely permissive. It just focuses on one thing that is not uh, uh, allowed. So that's exactly what we wanted. Which is just the only thing we don't want is someone to monetize Airbyte because at that point they won't be sharing their revenue with our community. And we want to make sure that we can do it. 
So do you think so? So is uh, so everything we? I'm assuming Airbyte formal uh, primarily focus on structured data. You know, yes. uh, people who are building uh, warehouses or lake houses, right? So yeah, uh, is is unstructured data not something that uh, these EL tools care about? Maybe, um, but definitely not the focus today. Yeah. Uh, I think on the structured data, you have a lot that we can do. For right now, we're really focusing on all these ingestion piece into uh, lake house or, or data warehouses. But there is the other piece of it, which is, once the data has been merged, has been cleaned up, has been segmented, like how do you actually get it out into other platforms where the data can be activated? And that is something that we want to be working on in 2022. Like, I think the market is calling it reverse ETL. I, I hate that, uh, so that what, word. So basically <laughs> the idea is uh, uh, I use you to, to put things in my lake house and in my lake house, I do a bunch of things to give it some more structure. Now I'm going to share this data to other places, yes. but isn't that what the lake house does to some extent? I guess if you're doing BI and ML, yeah. maybe, there's I mean, other, me, maybe there's other systems that want this data. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it's exactly this. But the thing is, it's always the same problem. Yeah, it's, the, data. It's, the, it's the right term, reverse ETF. <laughs> Yeah, but if you look at it, everything is just extract and load. Like yeah, yeah. in that case, you're yeah, yeah. just extracting from a, a warehouse so, no, and no, loading. I, it I would say this uh, uh, sec second level EL. Huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. So, so, uh, so the idea is uh, actually the uh, the that data might be used in a data product downstream that has nothing to do with BI or ML or exactly. analytics, right? So, and it can also be used by non engineers it can be used by sales or by marketing like, what if i want to segment my data on my warehouse and then i want to replicate all these segments on my marketing uh, tool so i can better segment people and better uh, outreach to them so these are a lot of things that you can do it's just you need to get this data into these uh, tools so, so you folks basically take data from one system and put it in another system Exactly. Um, so someone like me who's working with data, I'm very concerned about, uh, at some point I become concerned, in the beginning I'm not, but at some point I become concerned about, you know, when I'm handing a data to from one uh, uh, piece of code to another, I want to make sure that's performance, that there's something about, you know, they should have some file format that they can agree on. So how, So is performance something you guys worry about? Uh, performance, you mean for the for for moving the because basically maybe you guys don't have to worry about that because you're more like a, a, a batch kind of yeah. uh, move things around and there's not a high performance penalty if if uh, things are a little slower. Yeah, I mean you're talking about serialization yeah. of the data. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean performance is always going to be. Uh, Okay. Yeah, so, 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 so what's the what's the division in your in your in your experience? What's the division among Airbyte users between streaming and batch? Yeah. So, I think when you're talking about streaming, you need to. It's important to understand like what is streaming solving for, because like there is also something people think when they say streaming, it means that it's real time. And so when you go down to what does real time means, you realize that it has different meaning. Near real. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Real exactly. time is and, like big data. Uh, yeah, you know? but so so it depends on what's big for you is different than what's big for me. Right? So, exactly, yeah. Ex that's exactly it. And yeah. what you realize is, we we do batches, but we do micro batches, meaning that our sources support this concept of incrementality of the data. So we have a way to start from where we start, and at that point we can just pick what is the frequency at which we want to run the replication. And if you'd say every minute, then every minute we're going to import every single new record or every record that has changed over the, the past minute. And that means that, first of all, your volume is going to be pretty low. Uh, and even if it's like one gigs, that's something you can pretty trivially uh, sync uh, in a minute. Um, 
So I think with micro batches, you get the both the best of both worlds, which is you can accommodate streaming use cases, and you you have the simplicity of batch, yeah. which is yeah, yeah. Uh, and you don't need a you don't need a specialized system. Exactly. Right. Um, so we when we talk about EL, we kind of assume that everything is a big data source to a big warehouse or lake house, right? But in a company, one unsolved problem, Michelle, is uh, Microsoft Excel. So, <laughs> so, so, how do, do you guys uh, help companies tame their Excel explosion? <laughs> so, great question. Yeah, I would say today, and that's probably something we do with uh, with cloud is the ability to feed your files. Now it works, I mean, your, the use case you're describing works extremely well when it's a cloud product. Like if it's Google Spreadsheet, that's done already. We already have a way of replicating uh, spreadsheets. Um, now, if when it's a physical file, that's, uh, that's a yeah, different And now, now, now a lot of the non-technical people are starting to use things like Airtable, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Airtable, I think we have, a contributor working on a, uh, an integration for Airtable. So but with the with the democratization of data, that means there's going to be a lot more data sources. Exactly, exactly, and it's going to be very hard for non-open source companies to get to to keep up with it because building it's relatively easy. Maintenance is where the cost actually is. So, so they will always have to make this ROI decision about. Do I really want to put my finger into, I mean, to get my finger into this into this integration or not? So I was joking about it earlier, but as, as we were as we're talking right now, it strikes me that at some point you you folks will have to use ML just to have present me with a reasonable dashboard. Otherwise, the dashboard is, you know, it's gonna be hard to consume. There's too many things to to monitor, right? Yeah, that is true. Um, we'll see. I yeah. think thinking about ML, if you don't have the data, is a uh, is premature, yeah. or, the, or you don't face a problem is uh, is premature. Um, but I, I'm sure it's probably going to be something very simple in origin initially with some like rule based systems, etc. But I can imagine that the product is going to become more and more advanced with time. So, so besides the schema evolution, mm -hmm. uh, what aspects of data quality? Maybe you can, do you guys help with data quality because you can if you can capture data quality at your stage, that yeah. really helps solves a lot of headaches, right? Yes, yeah. the very good point. That's exactly that's something that we want to also be working on. Which is right now we're focusing on building the pipes but we want to make these pipes uh, smarter. And quality is one of them. Uh, data reduction is one of them. Like typically you might be replicating data from uh, a source that contain a social security number. You want to put that into your warehouse. You probably don't want your data analyst to have access to social security number. So how do you bring, how do you put filters and, uh, and, uh, and checks in between the sources and the destination to ensure that you you have access to the data, but you also have the the, the legal right to access that data. <laughs> and and you know also a few years ago, and now actually there's a a bunch of startups I'm advising one of them around metadata. Mm -hmm. You know how metadata the, these uh, uh, tech companies in the Bay Area started building these metadata management systems, but you guys already have access to all the source systems you can you can pro, you can kind of monitor metadata as well right yes we can yeah and so the, so whatever benefits can be derived from metadata which would include uh, i guess the main application so far has been discovery mm -hmm. data yeah. discovery right so you yeah. you guys everything might... related to cataloging yeah. but at that point you know we probably don't want to be building a cataloging product, but what we want to do, and that's the type of thing we want to do in 2022 is like, how do we integrate with existing product? Because I don't know if you have uh, a company that does cataloging, 
one thing that they are missing, if they just focus on um, like the data warehouse, yeah. they might just have a partial view of exactly of yeah. the, what the data is. And if they can integrate with us, then suddenly they get access to more. Um, they might have access to documentation about every single field. They might have access to lineage information, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one thing we, we want to do. Yeah, it's but, really a, a catalog of the raw yeah. assets, right? Before yeah. it gets transformed even. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Cool. This has been great. Uh, and uh, I'm assuming you folks are hiring all sorts we are of people, hiring. right? Yes. So, uh, so uh, what what sort of people are you hiring? So I would say today what we're hiring is for uh, uh, people that have uh, a very a good background, either in Java or in Python. Um, and we're more looking for senior profiles and doesn't have to be like too senior, but at least four, five years of, uh, of experience. Working on data is a, is a big plus. Uh, so you understand like, the challenges and the product that we're building. Um, and yeah, so that would be more for the engineering side, software engineering side. And after that, we're also hiring on the on the go-to-market. Uh, very cool. And uh, with that, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ben.